the education of an organizer. The building of many mass power organizations to merge into a national popular power force cannot come without many organizers. Since organizations are created in large part by the organizer, we must find out what creates the organizer. This has been the major problem in my years of organizational experience, the finding of potential organizers and their trainings. For the past two years, I've had a special training school for organizers with a full-time 15-month program. Its students have ranged from middle-class women activists to Catholic priests and Protestant ministers of all denominations, from militant Indians to Chicanos to Puerto Ricans to blacks from all over the part of the black power spectrum, from Panthers to radical philosophers, from a variety of campus activists, SDS, and others, to a priest who is joining a revolutionary party in South America. Geographically, They've come from campuses, Jesuit seminaries in Boston, to Chicanos from tiny Texas towns, middle-class people from Chicago and Hartford and Seattle and almost every place in between. An increased number of students come from Canada, from the indigenous of the Northwest, to the middle class of the maritime provinces. For years before the formal school was begun, I spent most of my time on the education as an organizer of every member of my staff. The education of an organizer requires frequent, long conferences on organizational problems, analysis of power patterns, communication, conflict tactics, the education and development of community leaders, and the methods of introduction of new issues. In these discussions, we have found ourselves dealing with quite a range of issues. Internal problems of a clique in Los Angeles organizations out to rid uh, uh, of its organizers, a tree-selling fundraising fiasco in Ho San Jose and why it failed, a massive voter registration drive in a Chicago protest which was being delayed in getting started, a group in Rochester, New York, attacking the organizer so that they could get their hot hands on the funds earmarked for their organization, and so on and so forth. Always the potential organizer's personal experience was used as the basis for teaching. Always after the problem was solved, there would be a long session in which a post-mortem would dissect the specifics and then stitch them into a synthesis, a body of concepts. All experiences are significant only insofar as they're related to and illuminating a central concept. History does not repeat specific situations. If any of the examples in these pages are read isolated from the general concept, they will be nothing more than a series of anecdotes. Everything became a learning experience. Frequently, personal dogmatic uh, domestic hangups were a part of the conferences. An organizer's working schedule is so continuous that time is meaningless. Meetings and caucuses drag endlessly into the early morning hours. Any schedule is marked by constant, unexpected, unscheduled meetings. Work pursues an organizer into his or her home so that either he or she is on the phone or that there are people dropping by near continuously. Further, the tensions, the hours, the home situation, the opportunities do not argue for fidelity. Also, with the rare exception, I have not known really competent organizers who are concerned about celibacy. Here and there are wives and husbands, or those in love relationships who understand and are committed to the work, but are really real sources for strength to the organizer. Besides the full-timers, there were the community leaders whom we trained on the job to be organizers. Organizers who are not only essential uh, to start and build an organization, but they're also essential to keep it going. Maintaining interest in activity, keeping the group's goals strong and flexible at once in a different operation, but still organization. As I look back on the results of those years, they seem to be a potpourri with which I would judge more failures than successes. Here and there are organizers who are outstanding in their chosen fields and are featured by the press as my trained protégés. But to me, the overall record has been unpromising. Those out of their local communities who were trained on the job achieved certain levels and were at the end of their line. If one thinks of an organizer as a highly imaginative and creative architect and engineer, then the best we've been able to train on the job were skilled plumbers, electricians, and carpenters, all essential to the building and maintenance of their community structure, but incapable of going elsewhere to design and execute a new structure in a new community. 
Then there are the others who learn to be outstanding organizers, in particular kinds of communities with particular ethnic groups, but in a different scene with different ethnic groups, couldn't organize their way out of a paper bag. Then there were those rare campus activists who could organize a substantial number of students, but they were utter failures when it came to trying to communicate with and organize lower middle class workers. Labor union organizers turned out to be poor community organizers. Their experiences were t- uh, was tied to a pattern of fixed points, whether it was a definitive uh, demand on wages, pensions, vacation periods, or other working conditions, and all of this was anchored into particular contract dates. Once the issues were settled and the contract signed, the years before the next contract negotiation held only grievance meetings about charges on contract violations by either side. Mass organization is a different animal. It is not housebroken. There are no fixed chronological points or definite issues. The demand is always changing. The situation is fluid and ever-shifting, and many of the goals are not in concrete terms of dollars and hours, but are psychological and constantly changing, like such stuff as dreams are made of. I've seen labor organizers almost out of their minds from the community organizational scene. When labor leaders have talked about organizing the poor, their talk has been based on nostalgia, a wistful look back to the labor organizers of the CIO though the, uh, th- through the Great Depression of the 30s. Those labor organizers, Powers Hapgood, Henry Johnson, Lee, Press- Lee Pressman, for, ex- uh, for instance, were primarily middle-class revolutionary activists to whom the CIO labor organizing drive was just one of many activities. The agendas of those labor union mass meetings were 10% on the specific problems of the union and 90% speakers on the conditions and needs of the Southern Okies, the Spanish Civil War, and the International Brigade, raising funds for blacks who were on trial in some southern state, demanding higher relief for the unemployed, denouncing police brutality, raising funds for anti-Nazi organizations, demanding an end to American sales of scrap iron to the Japanese military complex, and on and on. They were radicals, and they were good at their job. They organized vast sectors of middle-class America in support of their programs. But they're gone now. And any semblance between them and the present professional labor organizer is in title only. Among the organizers I trained and failed with, there were some who memorized the words and then related, uh, and the related experiences and concepts. Listening to them like listening to a tape playing back my presentation word for word. Clearly there was little understanding. Clearly they could, do, uh, they could not do more than elementary organization. The problem with so many of them was, and is, their failure to understand that a statement of a specific situation is significant only in its relationship to and its illumination of a general concept. Instead, they see the specific actions as a terminal point. They find it difficult to grasp the fact that no situation ever repeats itself, that no tactic can be precisely the same. Then there were those who had trained in schools of social work to become community organizers. Community Organization 101, 102, and 103. They had done field work and acquired even a specialized vocabulary. They called it CO, which to us means Conscientious Objector, or Community Org, which to us evokes a huge Freudian fantasy. Basically, the difference between their goals and ours, is that they organize to get rid of four-legged rats and stop there. We organize to get rid of four-legged rats so that we can get on to removing two-legged rats. Among those who, disillusioned, reject the formalized garbage they learned in school, the odds are heavily against their developing into effective organizers. One reason is that despite the verbal denunciations of their past training, there's a strong subconscious block against repudiating two to three years of life spent in this training, as well as the financial cost of these courses, of course. Through these years, I have constantly tried to search out reasons for our failures, as well as our occasional successes in training organizers. 
our teaching methods, those of others, our personal competency for teaching, and improvised new teaching method, uh, teaching approaches have and are being examined. Our own self-criticism is far more rigorous than that of our most bitter critics. All of us have faults. I know that in a community working as an organizer, I have unlimited, uh, I have unlimited patience in talking to and listening to the local residents. Any organizer must have this patience. But among my faults is that in a teaching position, at the training institute or at the conferences, I become an intellectual snob with unimaginative, limited students, impatient, bored, and inexcusably rude. I've improvised teaching approaches. For example... Uh, for example, knowing that one can only communicate and understand in terms of one's experience, we had to construct experience for our students. Most people do not accumulate a body of experience. Most people go through life undergoing a series of happenings, which pass through their system undigested. Happenings become experiences when they're digested, when they're reflected upon, related to general patterns and synthesized. There's meaning to that cliche we learn from our experience. Our job was to shovel those happenings back into the student system so he could digest them into experience. During a seminar, I would say, life is the expectation of the unexpected. The things you worry about rarely happen. Something new, the unexpected, will usually come in from outside the ballpark. You're all nodding as if you understand, but you really don't. What I've said are just words to you. I want you to go to your private cubby holes and think for the next four hours. Try to remember all the things you worried about during the last years and whether they ever happened or what did happen. And then we'll talk about it. At the next session, the students' reactions were excited. Hey, you're right. Only one out of eight big worries I've ever had happened. And even then, that one was different from the way I worried about it. I understand what you mean. And he did. While the experience of trying to educate organizers has been nowhere so successful as I'd hoped, there was a great deal of education for me and my associates. We were constantly in a state of self-examination. First, we learned what the qualities of an ideal organizer are. And second, we were confronted with a basic question, whether it was possible to teach or educate for the achieving of these qualities. The area of expertise and communication is fundamental to an organizer. An organizer can communicate only within the areas of expertise of their audience. Otherwise, there is no communication. The organizer in their constant hunt for patterns, universalities, and meetings is always building up a body of experience. Through their imagination, they're constantly moving in on the happenings of others identifying with them and extracting their happenings into their own mental digestive system and thereby accumulating more experience. It's essential for communication that they know of their experiences. Since one can communicate only through the experiences of the other, it becomes clear that the organizer begins to develop an abnormally large body of experience. They learn the local legends, anecdotes, values, idioms. They listen to small talk, they refrain from rhetoric foreign to the local culture. He knows that worn out words like white racist, fascist pig, and motherfucker have been so spewed that using them is now within the negative experience of the local people, serving only to identify the speaker as one of those and to turn off any further communication. And yet the organizer must not try to fake it. They must be themselves. I remember a first meeting with the Mexican-American leaders in a California barrio where they served me a special Mexican dinner. When we were halfway through, I put down my knife and fork saying, my God, do you eat this stuff because you like it or because you have to? I think it's as lousy as the Jewish kosher crap I had to eat as a kid. There was a moment of shocked silence and then everybody roared. 
Suddenly, barriers became, began to come down as they all began talking and laughing. They were so accustomed to the Anglo who would rave about the beauty of Mexican food, even though they knew it was killing him. The Anglo who had memorized a few Spanish phrases and the inevitable hasta la vista, that it was a refreshingly honest experience to them. The incident began uh, became uh, the incident became a legend to many, and you would hear them say, for instance, he has as much use for that guy as Zelensky has for Mexican food. A number of Mexican American Mexican Americans present confessed that they only ate some of those dishes when they entertained an Anglo. The same faking goes on with whites on certain items of black soul food, chitlins. There's a difference between honesty and rude disrespect of another's tradition. The organizer will err far less by being himself than by engaging in professional techniques when the people really know better. It shows respect for people to be honest, as in the Mexican dinner episode. They're being treated as people and not guinea pigs being techniqued. It's most important that this action be understood in context. Prior to my remark... There had been a warm personal discussion of the problems of the people. They knew not only of my concern about their plight, but that I liked them as people. I felt their response in friendship, and we were together. It's in this totality of the situation that I did what I did. Otherwise, it would have been offensive. The qualities we are trying to develop in organizers in the years of attempting to train them included some qualities that in all probability probably cannot be taught. They either had them or they could get them only through a miracle from above or below. Other qualities they might have as potentials that could be developed. Sometimes the development of one quality triggered off unsuspected ones. I learned to check against the list and spot the negatives. And if it was impossible to develop that quality, at least I could be aware and on guard to try and diminish its negative effect upon the work. Here is the list of the ideal elements of an organizer. The items one's look, one look for in identifying potential organizers and in appraising the future possibilities of new organizers and the pivot points of any kind of educational curricula for organizers. Certainly, it is an idealized list. I doubt that such qualities in such intensity ever come together in one man or woman, yet the best of organizers should have them all to some extent, and any organizer needs at least a degree of each. Curiosity. What makes an organizer organize? He's driven by a compulsive curiosity that knows no limits. Warning cliches such as curiosity killed a cat are meaningless to them. For life, for them, is a search for a pattern, for similarities in seeming differences, for differences in seeming similarities, for an order in the chaos about us, and for a meaning to the life around them and its relationship to their own life, and the search shall never end. They go forth with the question as their mark and suspect that there are no answers, only further questions. The organizer becomes a carrier of the contagion of curiosity, for a people asking why are beginning to rebel. The questioning of the hitherto accepted ways and values is the reformation stage that precedes and is so essential to the revolution. Here, I couldn't disagree more with Freud. In a letter to Marie Bonaparte, he said, the moment a man questions the meaning and value of life, he is sick. If there is somewhere an answer about life, I suspect that the key to it is finding the core question. Actually, Socrates was an organizer. The function of an organizer is to raise questions that agitate, that break through the accepted patterns. Socrates, with his goal of know thyself, was raising the internal questions within the individual that are so essential for the revolution, which is external to the individual. So Socrates was carrying out the first stage of making revolutionaries. If he had been permitted to continue raising questions about the meaning of life, to examine life and refuse the conventional values, the internal revolution would soon have moved out into the political arena. Those who tried him and sentenced him to death knew what they were doing. 
irreverence. Curiosity and irreverence go together. Curiosity cannot exist without the other. Curiosity asks, is this true? Just because this has always been the way it is, is it the best or right way of life? The best or right religion, political or an economic value, morality. To the questioner, nothing is sacred. They detest dogma, defy any finite definition of morality, rebel against any repression of a free open search for ideas, no matter where they may lead. They're challenging, insulting, agitating, discrediting. The organizer stirs unrest. As with all life, this is a paradox, for their irreverence is rooted in deep reverence for the enigma of life and an incessant search for its meaning. It could be argued that reverence for others, for their freedom from injustice, from poverty, from ignorance, from exploitation, discrimination, disease, war, hate, and fear is not a necessary quality in a successful organizer. All I can say is that such reverence is a quality I would have to see in anyone I would undertake to teach. Imagination. Imagination is the inevitable partner of irreverence and curiosity. How can one be curious without being imaginative? According to Webster's Unabridged, imagination is the mental synthesis of new ideas from elements experienced separately. The broader meaning starts with the notion of mental imaging of things suggested but not previously experienced and thence expands to ideas of mental creation and poetic idealization, creative imagination. To the organizer, imagination is not only all this but something deeper. It's the dynamism that starts and sustains them in their whole life of action as an organizer. It ignites and feeds the force that drives them to organize for change. There was a time when I believed that the basic qualities that an organizer needed was a deep sense of anger against injustice and that this was the prime motivation that kept them going. I now know that this is something else. This abnormal imagination that sweeps them into a close identification with mankind and projects them into plight. They suffer with them and become angry at the injustice and begin to organize the rebellion. Clarence, uh, Clarence Darrow put it, uh, <clears throat> put it on more of a self-interested basis. Quote, I had a vivid imagination. Not only could I put myself in the other person's place, but I couldn't avoid doing so. My sympathies always went out to the weak, the suffering, and the poor. Realizing their sorrows, I tried to relive them. I tried to relieve them in order that I might myself be relieved. Imagination is not only the fuel for the force that keeps organizers organizing, it's also the basis for effective tactics and action. The organizer knows that the real action is in the reaction of the opposition. To realistically appraise and anticipate the probable reactions of the enemy, they must be able to identify with them, too, in their imagination and foresee their reactions in their actions. A sense of humor. Back to Webster's unabridged. Humor is defined as the mental faculty of discovering, expressing, or appreciating ludicrous or absurdly incongruous elements in ideas, situations, happenings, or acts, or a changing and uncertain state of mind. The organizer, searching with a free and open mind, void of certainty, hating dogma, finds laughter not just as a way to maintain their sanity, but also a key to understanding life. Essentially, life is a tragedy, and the converse of tragedy is comedy. One can change a few lines in any Greek tragedy, and it becomes a comedy, and vice versa. Knowing that contradictions are the signposts of progress, he is ever on the alert for contradictions. A sense of humor helps an organizer identify and make sense out of them. Humor is essential to a successful tactician, for the most potent weapon known to mankind is satire and ridicule. A sense of humor enables an organizer to maintain their perspective and see themselves for what they really are, a bit of dust that burns for a fleeting second. 
a sense of humor is incompatible with the complete acceptance of any dogma, any religious, political, or economic prescription for salvation. It synthesizes with curiosity, irreverence, and imagination. The organizer has a personal identity of their own that cannot be lost by absorption or acceptance of any kind of group, discipline, or organization. I now begin to understand what I stated somewhat intuitively in Reveille for Radicals almost 20 years ago. The organizer, in order to be a part of all, can be a part of none. A bit of a blurred vision of a better world. Much of an organizer's daily work is detail, repetitive, and deadly in its monotony. In the totality of things, he is engaged in one small bit. It is though, as an artist, he is painting a tiny leaf. It is inevitable that sooner or later, they'll react with, what am I doing? Spending my whole life just painting one little leaf. The hell with it, I quit. What keeps them going is a blurred vision of a great mural where other artists, organizers, are painting their bits, and each piece is essential to the total. An organized personality. The organizer must be well organized themselves so that they can be comfortable in a disorganized situation, rational in a sea of irrationalities. It is vital that they be able to accept and work with irrationalities for the purpose of change. With very rare exceptions, the right things are done for the wrong reasons. It's fuel, it's fuel to demand that men do the right thing for the right reasons. This is a fight with a windmill. The organizer should know and accept that the right reason is only introduced as a moral rationalization after the right end has been achieved. Although it may have been achieved for the wrong reasons, therefore, they should search for and use the wrong reasons to achieve the right goals. They should be able, with skills and calculation, to use irrationality in their attempts to progress towards a rational world. For a variety of reasons, the organizer must develop multiple issues. First, a wide-based membership can only be built on many issues. When we're building our organizations in the back of the yards, the Polish Roman Catholic churches in Chicago joined us because they were concerned about the expanding power of the Irish Roman Catholic churches. The Packing House Workers Union was with us, so their rival unions joined, trying to counteract the potential membership and power pickup. We didn't, of course, care why they joined us. We just knew we'd be better off if they did. The organizer recognizes that each person or block has a hierarchy of values. For instance, let us assume that we're in a ghetto community where everyone is for civil rights. A black man there had bought a small house when the neighborhood was first changing, and he wound up paying a highly inflated price, more than four times the value of the property. Everything he owns is tied to that house. Urban renewal now is threatening to come in and take it on the basis of a value appraisal according to their criteria, which would be less than a fourth of his financial commitment. He's desperately trying to save his own small economic world. Civil rights would get him to a meeting once a month. Maybe he'd sign some petitions and maybe he'd give a dollar here and there, but on a fight against urban renewal's threat to wipe out his property, he'd be there at meetings every night. Next door to him is a woman who's renting. She's not concerned about urban renewal. She has three small girls, and her major worry is the drug pushers and pimps that infest the neighborhood and threaten the future of her children. She is for civil rights too, but she's more concerned about a community free of pimps and drug pushers, and she wants better schools for her children. Those are her number one priorities. Next door to her is a family on welfare. Their number one priority is more money. Across the street, there's a family who can be described as the working poor, struggling to get along on their drastically limited budget. To them, consumer prices and local merchants, gouging are the number one priorities. Any tenant of a slumlord living along rats and cockroaches will quickly tell you that their number one priority is, and so it goes. 
In a multiple issue organization, each person is saying to the other, I can't get what I want alone and neither can you. Let's make a deal. I'll support you for what you want and you support me for what I want. Those deals become the program. Not only does a single or even a dual issue organization condemn you to a small organization, it's axiomatic that a single issue organization won't last. An organization needs action as an individual needs oxygen. With only one or two issues, there will certainly be a lapse of action, and then comes death. Multiple issues means constant action in life. An organizer must become sensitive to everything that is happening around them. They're always learning, every incident teaching something. They notice when a bus has only a few empty seats. The crowd trying to get on will push and shove. If there's many empty seats, the crowd will be courteous and considerate. And they muse that in a world of opportunities for all, there would be a change in human behavior for the good. In their constant examination of life and of themselves, they find themselves becoming more and more of an organized personality. A well-integrated political schizoid. The organizer must become schizoid, politically speaking, in order to not slip into becoming a true believer. Before men can act, an issue must be polarized. Men will act when they are convinced that their cause is 100%. On the side of the angels, and that the opposition are 100% on the side of the devil. He knows that there can be no action until issues are polarized to this degree. I've already discussed an example in the Declaration of Independence, the Bill of Particulars that conspicuously omitted all of the advantages the colonies gained from the British and cited only the disadvantages. What I'm saying is that the organizer must be able to split themselves into two parts. One part in the arena of action when they polarize the issue to a uh, to hundred to nothing and helps to lead their forces into conflict, while the other part knows that when the time comes for negotiations, it's really only 10% difference. And yet both parts have to live comfortably with each other. Only a well-organized person can split and yet stay together. But this is what the organizer must do. Ego. Throughout these desired qualities is an interwoven, strong ego. One might describe as monumental in terms of solidity. Here we're using the word ego as discussed in the previous chapter, clearly differentiated from egotism. Ego is unreserved confidence in one's ability to do what they must be, uh, that must be done. An organizer must accept without fear or worry that the odds are always against them. Having this kind of ego, they, that makes them a doer, and they do. The thought of copping out never stays with them for more than a fleeting moment. Life is action. A free and open mind and political relativity. The organizer in their way of life, with their curiosity, irreverence, imagination, sense of humor, distrust of dogma, and self-organization with an understanding of irrationality of much of human behavior becomes a flexible personality, not a rigid structure that breaks when something unexpected happens. Having their own identity, they have no need for the security of an ideology or a panacea. They know that life is a quest for uncertainty, and the only certain fact of life is uncertainty, and they can live with it. It knows that all values are relative in a world of political relativity. Because of these qualities, they're unlikely to disintegrate into cynicism and disillusionment, for he does not depend on illusion. Finally, the organizer is constantly creating the new out of the old. They know that all new ideas arise from conflict, and that every time man has had a new idea, it's been a challenge to the sacred ideas of the past and the present, and inevitably a conflict rages. Curiosity, irreverence, imagination, sense of humor, a free and open mind, an acceptance of the relativity of values and of the uncertainty of life all inevitably fuse into a kind of person whose greatest joy is creation. 
They conceive of creation as the very essence of the meaning of life. In their constant striving for the new, they find that they can't endure what is repetitive and unchanging. For them, hell would be doing the same thing over and over again. This is the basic difference between the leader and the organizer. The leader goes on to build power to fulfill their desires, to hold and wield the power for purposes both social and personal. They want power themselves. The organizer finds their goal in creation of power for others to use. These qualities are present in any free creative person, whether an educator or in the arts or in any part of life. In Adam Smith's The Money Game, the characteristics, uh, characteristics of the desirable fund manager are described. It's personal intuition, sensing patterns of behavior. There's always something unknown, undiscerned. You can't just graduate an analyst into managing funds. What is, uh, what is it the good managers have? It's a kind of locked-in concentration, an intuition, a feel, nothing that can be schooled. The first thing you have to know is yourself. A man who knows himself can step outside himself and watch his own reactions like an observer. One would think that this is the description of an organizer, but in everything creative, whether it's organizing a mutual fund or a mutual society, one is on the hunt for these qualities. One becomes an organizer instead of something else. Why one becomes that organizer is, I suspect, due to a difference of degree of intensity of specific elements or relationship between them, or an accident. 